the history of slavery is as long as the history of humanity and spans almost every single culture and ethnicity. As long as humans have had civilization, we've had ways to subjugate each other. Basically, we all suck. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to a day in history. Long before the ancient Greeks, Romans, Persians and other civilizations were even older ones with few surviving records, like the Mesopotamians. This civilization gives us our first known records of slavery in law, although even these glimpses of over 4,000 years into the past suggest that slavery is much older than the written proof we have today. Fragments of other texts have mentioned slaves in these civilizations and earlier ones, but the legal records we'll be looking at in this video are the ones from where we can distinguish the most information. So, what are the first recorded instances of slavery? Let's take a look, and don't forget to check out part two for a brief timeline of slavery all the way from these ancient records to modern day. In early civilizations, there are legal codes that include some of the first written, recorded instances of slavery, all of which are from different but similar periods in ancient Mesopotamia. The main five we'll be looking at are the Code of Urnamu, the Code of Eshnuna, the Code of Lipit Ishtar, the Code of Hammurabi, and the Code of Nesilim. Each was inscribed on ancient tablets or pieces of steel and contained multiple mentions and legal proceedings to do with slaves, suggesting it was a key part of the ancient civilization's workings and existed long before the records we have since uncovered suggest. The Code of Urnamu takes its name from King Urnamu of Ur, who ruled circa 2112 to 2095 BC, although there is historical debate whether he wrote the laws or if it was in fact his son, Shulgi. This code is the oldest, comprehensive surviving legal codes we have, although we do have fragments of older ones like the Code of Urakagina. Initially, two surviving fragments of the Code of Urnamu were found at Nippur, now known as Iraq, and then later, in 1965, Further tablets found at Ur allowed historians enough information to discern 32 of the 57 laws. Of the 32 surviving laws we can take from the tablets, seven refer to instances of slaves and slavery. These laws allow us an insight into the ancient Mesopotamian society. From the text, it seems like the civilization of Ur split people into two categories, the Lu, or free person, and the slave known as Arad, if male, and Gemi, if female. From the surviving laws, we can discern slaves had some rights and freedoms, although the extent of these is unknown. For example, two of the entries refer to slaves marrying, in one case to another slave, and in another, a free person. The first law translates as, if a slave marries a slave, and that slave is set free, he does not leave the household. And the second, if a slave marries a native, i.e. free person, he or she is to hand the firstborn son over to his owner. This tells us a few things, namely both that slaves could marry and that they could be set free, with some caveats. The other laws refer to slaves who have escaped, female slaves who have been rude to their mistresses, and slaves given or taken from free men as punishment for their crimes. From this, we can discern that the treatment of slaves was very similar to later but still ancient civilizations such as the Greeks and Romans. Slaves were property and could be traded and treated as such. We'll look at the next two codes together as various sources theorize different dates of their creation. For example, some say the laws of Eshnunna date to 1930 BC while others attribute to the code much closer to Lipit Ishtar, approximately 1870 to 1860 BC. Therefore, we can look at the two together and compare their laws on slavery. In the code of Eshnunna, we see a clear divide between free people and slaves. This builds off the established social hierarchy mentioned in the code of Urnamu, with not just names for free men and women and enslaved men and women, but also sons, daughters, and other codifications whose meaning we are unsure of. The Code of Eshnunna also gives our first information on the price of slaves, 
For example, it states that if a dog or ox kills a free man, the penalty to the owner is 40 shekels. However, if they kill a slave, they only need to pay 15. Lipit Ishtar also refers to free men giving 15 shekels as punishment to an unknown crime, or if they don't have 15, then one of their slaves, much like the punishment in Eshnunna. These texts arguably are extremely similar and likely were created off the back of very similar laws, but both help give a wider picture of slavery in ancient Mesopotamian society. In addition, both texts refer to instances of stealing slaves, freeing them, and marrying them. In both scenarios, the children of the slaves, if acknowledged by the master, are not given the same rights as free-born children. Both codes also address what to do if a slave runs away. Although we don't know how common this is, it shows that it was frequent enough to be placed in law. This brings us to the best known and most extensive of these ancient codes, the Code of Hammurabi. A lot of historical articles and videos will jump straight in here when discussing the origins of slavery and ignore the earlier codes for ease and simplicity. That's probably because we know far more about the Code of Hammurabi in that it's the longest of all these ancient codes, containing over 300 laws and has the most amount of information preserved for us to glean from today. For one, we see three societal distinctions in the Code of Hammurabi. Instead of just free men and slaves like earlier texts, there is a third additional category, the land-owning wealthy class. For another, the Code of Hammurabi lives by the principle, an eye for an eye, and, fun fact, Hammurabi himself is where the phrase originates. This means that any crime that is committed, the punishment should be of equal measure. For example, if a man destroys the eye of a gentleman's slave, then they should pay half the slave's fee, as they are now worth half as much. They also reduce both punishment and payment for instances referring to slaves. A doctor's fee could be 10 shekels to a gentleman, 5 to a freeman, but only 2 for a slave. The Code of Hammurabi is quite extensive and also covers areas such as if a slave were to run away, harboring fugitive slaves, freeing slaves, and the punishment of troublesome slaves, usually resulting in harsher punishments than the preceding codes of law suggest were in effect centuries earlier. This can include anything from execution to the mutilation or removal of limbs and other body parts. And finally, also known as the Hittite laws, the Code of Nisilim is the last of the most ancient tablets we'll look at in this video. Several tablets found have established the code contained at least 200 laws dating back to 1650 to 1500 BC. Later, existing copies suggest that this code, or parts of it at least, were in effect all the way up to the end of the Hittite Empire in 1100 BC. They also didn't seem to change much, and some historians argue that a lot of the laws laid down in the Hebrew Bible a few hundred years later were initially from the Code of Nesilim. Unlike earlier codes, the Code of Nesilim shows a slight shift in how people of the time perceived slaves. Although still considered lesser than free men and women, the Code actually had provisions and punishments for if a slave was harmed by someone else. For example, one law states, if anyone blind a male or female slave or knocks out their teeth, he shall give ten half shekels of silver, he shall let it go to his home. This suggests that not only were people punished for cruel treatment towards slaves, but that if they crippled them, they were then held responsible for looking after them thereafter. The code covers humane treatment of slaves, and there are laws that show they could choose who to marry, buy property, open businesses, and purchase their freedom. It even covers a divorce-type aspect to relationships, and provisions for slaves marrying free men and each other. Compared to the earlier codes, the Code of Nesilim was almost kind, with far less severe punishments for those who broke the law. So, that ends our video on the five most ancient legal codes we have fragments of today. They give us a glimpse into the first ever slaves and the earliest civilization's mentality towards enslaved people. Don't forget to subscribe and tune in to part two 
where we'll look at a brief timeline of history all the way from these ancient tablets to modern day.